John Frederick Charles Fuller, born in 1878, died in 1966, is mainly known as a senior British army officer, a strategist, prolific writer, and one of the most original and creative thinkers on military philosophy. He holds the rank of Major General, wrote over 45 books and articles, and developed the concept of modern warfare, which was rejected by the British Army, but led to the development of Blitzkrieg, a tactics used so successfully by Hitler in the Second World War. From teenage years, Fuller was fascinated by mysticism, mythology, and hermeticism. His interest in the subject has deepened during the Second Boer War in 1899, when he had an insight into over 200 books on philosophy and religion. In 1903, during his stay in India, he studied Hinduism, Yoga, Vedas, and Upanishads. About two years later, he went through a serious moral transformation when he read books by Havelock Ellis, Studies in Psychology of Sex, and Houston's A Plea for Polygamy. During the same period, he wrote anti-Christian texts to the anarchist magazine called A Gnostic Journal. In 1907, he wrote The Star in the West, a critical analysis of the poetry of English mystic Alistair Crowley. There is no doubt that Fuller was not merely praising poetry of the wickedest man of, of the, in the world, as the English Yellow Press described Crowley. Given his youthful fascination with the occult, interspersed with transgressive visions about releasing society from the bonds of Victorian morality, Fuller could see in Crowley's philosophy of Philema, and in particular in Crowley himself, an incarnation of principles he adhered. No wonder did they soon met and became friends. Fuller joined Crowley's magical order called DAA. He became involved in editing its journal, The Equinox, helped to compose Crowley magical biography, serialized under the title The Temple of Solomon the King, and also contributed many diagrams and drawings. Crowley made a comment on Fuller's artwork in his autobiography, The Confessions. Quote, his draftmanship, within certain limits, was a miracle. Certain subjects were altogether beyond him. He couldn't portray the human figure, but his symbolic drawings shows the highest qualities of imagination and execution, and his geometrical work is almost perfect and beyond me to appreciate. His images are more vivid than those of any writer I have ever known. The long years of our friendship were indeed fertile. We saw each other nearly every day and worked together in perfect harmony. Fuller didn't create only small, precise diagrams, but also much bigger visionary paintings that they were supposed to decorate walls of the AA temple. Here, for example, on this slide, we see a painting called The Portal of the Abyss. On the back of it, the artist wrote, it is a design for the third portal, or initiatory gate, in the temple of the AA to be erected in London. Some of his artwork was published in many books or on occult or used as book covers. But to my knowledge, it has never been collected together, and I'm not aware of any critical analysis in regards to the artist's medium, sources of inspiration, and the content of his work. This comes as a surprise when we discovered Fuller to be a symbolist whose art can be seen as a vital part of the iconography of the Western mystery tradition. Vital not only because of its aesthetic beauty, but also because it offers a rich vocabulary, allowing us to translate experience of the sacred into rational language of the profane. My presentation seems to be the very first attempt 
of drawing, drawing attention to the corpus of Fuller's art, and I suggest it can become a subject of serious research. The idea of decorating, Fuller's, uh, of decorating walls with Fuller's art brings to mind monasteries of Tibet and Egyptian temples. We can clearly see that he was inspired by, by the symbolism of those traditions. Raffle deities, mandalas, sacred geometry, initiatory formulae taken from Kabbalah and alchemy, and perfect symmetry of design creates in observer lasting impression indeed. Line, color, and theme is evocative enough to transpose and transfer our imagination to the ancient times, where deep spiritual urge and the sense of wonder were far beyond rational comprehension, and as a result, they were translated in the concept of gods and divine hierarchies. This is the role of the sacred space, to serve as a meeting point between earth and heaven, between earth and hell. Psyche, confronted with the unconscious, translated through the language of art into living symbols, discovers that divine is tangible and the truth is revealed in beauty. Over 10 years after the most intense period of collaboration between Crowley and Fuller, the Beast founded in Cefalu, Sicily, his experimental social magical commune, the Abbey of Lima. Inspired by French impressionist Paul Gauguin, he covered walls of the house with grotesque and obscene murals. Despite the fact they seemed to be naive and to some extent vulgar, they embodied Crowley's spiritual philosophy. Very often, in paintings of Gauguin and Crowley, object becomes a sign, expression of ideas, and not mere a reflection of the reality that we perceive with the naked eye. As a result of such approach, we see emergency of symbolism and other schools such as Fauvism or Lenabe movement characterized by rejection of academic approach to art. Crowley's murals in infamous Chamber of Nightmares portray hell as false intellectual and moral consciousness. On another wall, there were images depicting teachings of the AA and doctrines of the Holy Books of Philema. Other murals showed love expressed in earthly terms. One of his students, actress Jane Wolfe, said that there were Hollywood-like scenography to Dante's Inferno. One of the guests at the Abbey reported that Crowley was serving as a guide and describing murals with those words. Quote, there in the corner are lesbians, as large as life. Why do you feel shocked and turn away? Or perhaps overtly turn to look again? Because though you may have thought of such things, you have been afraid to face them. Drag all such thought into the light. Freud endeavored to break down such complexes in order to put the subconscious mind into a bourgeois respectability. This is wrong. The complexes should be broken down to give the subconscious will a chance to express itself freely." End of quote. Aspirant, studying at the Abbey, the mysteries of nature, was going through ordeals during which he or she contemplated all phantoms and delusions attacking the mind. The process was accompanied by meditation and solitude. Finally, the aspirant stayed closed for a certain period of time in the Chamber of Nightmares to work with rituals and meditations written so that they could resonate with the murals. The altered state of consciousness resulting from such contemplation animated the painting, and a person who dared to look into their content had an access to previously dormant and locked layers of his, her inner being. The aspirant was transformed into an initiate. Fuller's art is not as shocking as Crowley's, but it has strong impact on the observer 
and as such offers very powerful tools for meditation. It inspired another generation of artists. Here we see two works by Gary Dickinson representing an example of style inspired by that of Fuller. No wonder Fuller's paintings are used as decoration in some lodges of another Crowley's organization called Ordo Templi Orientis, OTO. Here we see magnificent temple space of San Graal Lodge in Trondheim, Norway. All paintings were created by Oda Perlusen and they are very close replicas of originals. I would like to spend a few minutes on another OTO temple space inspired by Fuller. Shangri-La Oasis, located in area of Gdańsk, Poland, where I live. Those murals were created by very gifted artist Agnieszka Skatua. She departed slightly from originals, but only in context of style, keeping the symbolism unchanged. Those two paintings, called Outer and Inner Portals, are located on Western and Eastern walls, respectively. In the West, we see a magician standing with the naked woman in the front of the pyramid. He seems to prepare himself for an initiation, and a woman perhaps symbolizes the unconscious. She is both the earthly, animal, instinctual side, as well as the heavenly, divine side. She's, she seems to represent the anima, an anthropomorphization of the unconscious mind, and a bridge between conscious self and the archetypal self, the true center of one's being. The pyramid itself is not a mere cenotaph, but a temple of initiation. It's filled with symbols of life, dancing flames, lotus flowers, gods and goddesses. Ten columns represent Kabbalistic tree of life, a glyph of creation and higher consciousness. Candidate enters the pyramid and sacrifices his lower mind. He is reborn as Osiris, Asar un Efer, the perfected one. Similar scenario takes place in the Gnostic Mass, the central ceremony of the OTO. In the West, there is a tomb from which comes the priest who leaves behind his material obsessions and prepares himself for the administration, the virtues to the brethren. Those virtues are mentioned later on in the mass. Health and wealth and strength and joy and peace and that fulfillment of will and of love under will that is perpetual happiness. There are seven of them and they can be attributed to the seven classical planets or lights seen at the top of Fuller's painting. In Kabbalah, seven is a number of Venus, indicating that the great work needs to be guided by love. On both sides, we see 13 little flames. 13 is a numerical value of Hebrew word Achbach, which means love, and Ahad, which means union. Here, therefore, we see a passion of the aspirant to become united with divine. The magician stands in the circle on which we can see 22 letters of Hebrew alphabet. The circle and letters mark borders of his rational universe. During recreation process of that part of the painting, we discovered that nearly all of reproductions of this particular Fuller's work are mirrored. Thus, we have male person on the left side and female on the right. When we made a scan and enlarged the picture, we could see that Hebrew letters were reversed. In all publications with that particular painting, editors mentioned Mary Evans' picture library as a source of illustration. It is my guess that during digitalization of the picture, somebody simply made a mistake. And here we have one of our keynote speaker, Mr. Richard Kaczynski, in the front of the original painting showing right position of the figures. On the east, we see a painting called the Inner Portal. It represents the abyss, the great void between the phenomenal world of manifestation and its nominal source. Crowley described in his book Little Essays Towards the Truth. Quote, this doctrine is extremely difficult to explain but it correspo corresponds more or less to the gap in thought between the real, which is ideal, and the unreal, which is actual. In the abyss, 
all things exist, indeed, at least in pause, but are without any possible meaning, for they lie the substratum of spiritual reality. They are appearances without law. They are thus insane delusions. Now the abyss being thus the great storehouse of phenomena, it is the source of all impressions. Crossing the abyss is one of the most critical steps in Crowley's mysticism. It requires transcendence of reason and limitations of ego. Crowley wrote in his essay, One Star Inside, quote, it is annihilation of all the bonds that compose self or constitute the cosmos, a resolution of all complexities into their elements, and these thereby cease to manifest, since things are only knowable in respect of their relation to and recreation on other things. End of quote. Crossing is dangerous and deals with unspeakable terror, not only because the void is guide, guided by the demon of reason, whose name is Horonzon, but also because failure in doing so is absolute. To quote Crowley again, should he fail by will or weakness to make his self-annihilation absolute, he is nonetheless thrust forth into the abyss. He remains in the abyss, secreting his elements around his ego as if isolated from the universe and becomes what is called a black brother. Such a being is gradually disintegrated from lack of nourishment and the slow but certain action of the attraction of the rest of the universe, despite efforts to insulate and protect him and to angradize himself by predatory practices. He may indeed prosper for a while, but in the end he must perish. And again, this experience is reflected on micro scale in the Gnostic Mass, when the priest moves to the east and thrones the priestess on the altar and finally dips his lance into her cup. For the very brief moment of orgasm, expressed symbolically by uttering the word Hriliu, male and female become quintessential one. In alchemical terms, red lion and white eagle create hermaphroditic rebis. All laws of time and space are suspended, the reason transcended and the trance of Shiva Darshana achieved. In the middle of the temple stands Deacon, who serves as a mediator between offices and congregation, between phenomenal universe and divine. In order to celebrate the mass, he or she needs to be an initiate of at least second degree, which is called the magician. And as such, he also represents the faculties of the conscious self. Those faculties must be balanced, developed, and trained. In the middle of Shangri-La temple, there is another reproduction of Fuller's painting called the sword. Here we see Blakian figure of Magus with his arms outstretched as if he, as if he was sacrificing himself to the service of the great work and mankind. Kundalini serpent is rising and on its body we see signs of planets and elements attributed to chakras. On the chest we see the rosy cross, the symbol of beauty and harmony. As one of Crowley's disciples, Frater Ahat wrote, quote, O thou who hast for the first time this day beheld the mysteries of the red rose whereon sparkleth the Jew, and of the golden cross from which cometh the light of the world, is not his symbol to be found upon the breast of all true brethren of the rosy cross? End of quote. Above the magician, we see alchemical symbols for salt and sulfur and a hexagram composed of red and blue triangles. All those elements indicate union of male and female, animus and anima, conscious self and the higher self. From another perspective, those three murals can be seen as symbolic representation of three degrees of the OTO, which represent the most crucial aspects of human existence. First degree is called birth, second degree is called life, and third degree is called death. Here we see an aspirant being born to this world as an initiate, leaving the tomb of initiation, mastering and balancing energies of life to finally face the great unknown and lie down in the pyramid. 
Fuller's paintings become allegory, allegory for the process of initiation. They capture its essence and enrich the experience of initiate. The fine arts become applied arts. They overlap and unify in this particular moment when we stand in a front of strangely painted walls and shiver with sense of great wonder, listening to the words from GFC Fuller's The Treasure House of Images. O thou unity of all things, as the water that poureth through the, my fingers of my hand, so art thou, O God, my God. I cannot hold thee, for thou art everywhere. O thou unity of all things, as the hot fire that flameth is too subtle to be held, so art thou, O God, my God. I cannot grasp thee, for thou art everywhere. O thou perfect nothingness of bliss. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you, thank you for keeping to time, Christoph, as well. No problem. So uh, we'll now open to questions from the floor. I think I better come over. Doesn't seem to be very loud, anyway. Uh, Christoph, thanks. That was very interesting. I was wondering if um, if uh, Fuller did much work for the British Union of Fascists, who he was a keen uh, sort of supporter and celebrant of, and mm -hmm. whether he'd done a lot of any sort of design work or illustration work for them. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, I didn't mention that Fuller was a member of uh, uh, Mosley's uh, Fascist Union. Uh, he wrote a couple pamphlets for them, that's for sure, but I've never seen any illustrations uh, done by Fuller for, for them. Maybe Richard uh, saw something? No. I, I would imagine he was mm. very involved with the BUF. So yeah. It seems so. as if his uh, artistic uh, part of life was clearly connected with Crowley. Yes, a question and a suggestion. The question is about uh, the location of uh, the painting. So where are they and how many they are. So a, a bit more information about uh, the, the, yeah, the, the material aspect mm -hmm. of this. And then the suggestion is while I was listening to you, it occurred to me that maybe an interesting comparison would be with Hilma F. Klint, uh, who was painting around the same time as Fuller was painting his own uh, um, images. And uh, the purpose of many of her paintings was the same, because some of the paintings were meant to be used in a temple. So mm -hmm. they're really made for decorating a temple for ritual purposes. Uh, we don't know that they were ever used for this, but that was the intention. And they were done around the same time. So that's, that's an interesting... Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, when it comes to the source material, I'm aware of two collections of Fuller, uh, Rutgers University in America um, and uh, King's College uh, in London. So uh, there are some paintings in both those in, in, in institutions. Um, King's College, I think uh, it's around 10-15, uh, paintings and drawings. Um, some of them were reproduced in the equinox, uh, but only black and white. King's College, they have originals. You can see them in full color. Any more questions? Yes, Christoph. Um, yes, uh, and Fuller come out. Yes. Um, Crowley, Crowley had a, um, a legal problems at the moment, and uh, uh, despite, uh, well, Instead of trying to uh, defend his friends, he uh, decided to go to a desert in Africa. Um, Fuller, being a you know, soldier, he said that Crowley simply didn't have enough courage. And that was the major problem between them. Yeah. But at the same time, they still liked each other. Uh, Crowley wrote uh, his autobiography many years after they departed, and he was praising Fuller's artwork. Uh, Fuller uh, considered Crowley to be one of the greatest British poets. Uh, he wrote a very short piece on that in 1966, and he, he st clearly stated that Crowley was fantastic. So, 
anymore. Going, going, <laughs> gone. Okay. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you.